الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Him We seek assistance with Allah and Allah alone And we seek forgiveness with Him Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides No one can misguide them and whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his infinite wisdom and justice allows to go astray, no one can guide them back except him. And I testify and I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger. Um, Brother Talha, may Allah reward him and bless him. He asked me if I can come and... and uh, Join your halaqah, may Allah bless your halaqat, Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it something that you will find yawm al-qiyamah uh, in seeking closeness to Him, and may Allah put barakah in it. And it seems like every MSA, the sisters are always out doing the brothers. I'm sure there's more Muslim brothers, Allahu alam, Allahu alam, but they just don't. Uh, in Arabic, we would say they don't, they don't have the, the harakah, they don't have that movement that drive within them to do what they're supposed to do and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the sisters for doing their part Allahumma ameen uh, just a quick point I'm your brother in Islam and uh, I'm advising you inshallah for, from my heart is that whenever you hear the name of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is that you send salah and salam upon him uh, we learned that he alayhi salatu salam was given an angel there's one angel specific to the prophet Muhammad that stays by him stays with him even in his grave and he conveys the salam he says yeah Muhammad such and such Fulan ibn Fulan he gives you salam and the prophet returns salam so the prophet is alive in his grave as we know the prophets they don't die in their grave and the martyrs their bodies are not eaten in the grave uh, is that they for him, Aisha he has a particular angel that gives salam, conveys salam. And the Prophet he also mentions in a hadith regarding uh, the cheapest of people. The Prophet said, do you know who the cheapest of people are? And they said, who is that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, the one who hears my name and does not send salam and salam upon me. And also another hadith which mentions sending salam and salam upon him is in the hadith where he said, Ameen, 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 he was standing on the pulpit the member in the masjid and it had three steps so the first step he said ameen the second step he said ameen the third step he said ameen and the companions they had no idea why he was saying ameen 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 so they said ya rasulullah you did something unusual why did you say ameen three times he said because jibreel alayhi salam he came to me and he said ya muhammad raghima an farajul may allah disgrace and humiliate the one and he mentioned three things of them was he sees Ramadan and Ramadan passes him by and, and he's not forgiven because of that month. Meaning in Ramadan you don't take the advantage, you don't take it and he, as it should be taken and you slack in that month of Ramadan or you don't fast properly or you don't lower your gaze properly or you don't hold your tongue properly and then Ramadan passes you by and you don't benefit from it. And another one was uh, the one who lives with one or both of his parents until they reach old age and they don't enter Jannah because of that which means if any of us has a parent or both of our parents and they are old of age and we're able to serve them and if we don't enter Jannah because of that we should be humiliated that's what Jibreel is making dua and the Prophet is saying Ameen to it so 100% this dua is 100% accepted a million percent accepted if that makes sense because the best of angels making dua which is already accepted and the Prophet is saying Ameen to it forget about it and then the last one is uh, may Allah humiliate and disgrace the one who hears your name and doesn't say Salah and Salah Salah and Salam upon it so let us not be lazy when it comes to saying it. Not that you guys are lazy. Maybe you guys heard that it's okay to say it quietly or whatever. There's no harm in you saying it out loud, inshallah, because it's better for you in your deen. Wallahu a'lam. So now we get back to the point. So he invited me to uh, come to the halaqah. And time permitted, alhamdulillah. And then I asked him, what's the topic? And then he told me, anything. And then I laughed. And then he said, uh, you pick. And I laughed harder. Because I only like to talk about one thing. It's not the only thing that I talk about, but it's one thing that if I had an option to choose one topic, it would be death. And I would stay talking about it 
from now until forever because death opens the door to everything. Um, this dunya is so short and what's in, what's, what's in this dunya is so short, it's so temporary. Death is that door that opens up our in infinite lifetime. It opens up our real life. So if I can talk about anything, I'll talk about death uh, and things that lead to death and how to prepare for death and what to do at the time of death and what to do after death and the barzakh, the life of the grave, the grave itself, the rewards, the punishments, so on and so forth. Jannah, Jahannam, Al-Hur, Alaykum Salaam, Tawbukat. So much can be spoken about death. So I figured that I would kill two birds, two birds with one stone. And since that I was preparing for, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with MGB, but MGB has a new headquarters in MCC, which I just call MGB. Now I try to get myself used to calling MCC MGB. I want to get that name uh, in into the uh, environment that MCC is now MGB. We took over, right? We uh, we stole it. That they asked me to do a long series about death. So inshallah ta'ala, one of the first class notes that we have, I will mention that to you guys here, and hopefully that will encourage you to come to the upcoming classes in MGB inshallah ta'ala. So, first and foremost, what should be understood about death, right? Before I talk about the reminders of death, and before I talk about um, the benefits of remembering death, and how the Prophet ﷺ said, the wisest of you is the one who remembers death most and how it actually affects us in our salah when you're constantly thinking about death or how it may affect us in our daily transactions with each other how we wear our hijab, how we talk to our brothers, how we talk to our sisters, so on and so forth when we constantly have death in mind, it kind of changes the attitude and it changes the environment for us before we talk about these things, we have to understand what is death what is maut, and what are the types of deaths because it's not just one death there's not just one type of death. So, what should be understood, guys, that death is part of al ghaib Anybody know what al ghaib is? Unseen. And the unseen, see, someone say, Nuruddin can't be unseen because we see people dying all the time. We see janazas, you go to the hospital, go to the morgue, go to the medical examiner, we see death. It's something that's seen. You can't say it's unseen. But there's things that happen within death that are unseen. Like, somebody want to tell me? The soul is part of the unseen, the ruh. Anybody else on your side? Punishments before death, through what? Through what means? How are they punished? Yes, but why? Punishment at the grave, that's for after death. How about at the time of death? Because now I'm trying to justify how death itself is from the unseen, although we can see parts of it, we can't see most of it. Nah. We, don't we don't know when it's going to happen, that's unseen, yes. Anybody else? Angels. angels, very good. What about the angels? Which angels? The angels of death, nah. they remove the soul from the body, very good. These are part of the unseen. Now you have to understand something. Before your soul is extracted, right? Before your soul comes out of the body, you are what? Alive. And you can see, so it's not part of the unseen. But while you're alive, you will see things that no one around you can see. Anybody have any idea besides the angels that they're mentioned that will take the soul? We mentioned, I'm not sure if you guys were there at CCNY, that the Prophet Muhammad he said that at the time of death, Malik al maut will sit at the head of the believer at the time to extract the soul and around the believer the hadith says as far as the eye can see meaning forward right and left you will see angels as far as the eye can see if you ever sat in a big auditorium and it's packed that's when you should think about it like this is how many angels I will see and you'll say no because I can see the wall so past that wall to the point where I can no longer see there will be an angel in front of me to the right and to the left and no one else will be able to see that. And if you guys have ever been around people who are dying, you hear many, many, many stories. Of them, is that someone would be dying, they'd be on their deathbed, and they would say something like, sit me up. Although prior to this, months and months, they were sick, they were not talking, they were not moving, they were not being active, but at this point they say, sit me up. Or make space. 
or look at our guests or who brought the guests here or what are you bringing for the guests like meaning food, drink, what, what are you bringing? and they would be asked, what are you talking about? what are you saying? we don't see anything is he okay? is he sick? he's dying, he must be really like really dying now and we learn that it's the angels we learn that it's the angels that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that are coming to take your soul and to witness your soul being extracted and to comfort you at that time this is part of the unseen and for the evildoers, the fujjar, those who are uh, wicked and openly rebellious they will have the opposite, they will see angels as far as the eye can see but they will not be welcoming they will not be amongst those who say نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرِ They will not say unto them We were your supporters and your helpers and your sponsors and your companions in the dunya and in the hereafter They will be unpleasant, unwelcoming And they will despise the soul And they will show this fierce nature with the soul And at that point the soul will not want to leave That's when the soul cowards into the body And it holds on to whatever it can hold on to So that it doesn't leave because it knows that if it was to leave now it would not receive the judgment that it would want to receive. Right? So let us keep moving. Is that the death? Assalamu alaikum, Habib. Hala. Barakallahu feek. Is that we mentioned the angels? Is that death has aspects to it that is unseen even prior to the soul being taken out, inshaAllah. So that's of the things that we understand about Al Ghaib. Now, Al Ghaib is something crucial to our Iman believing in the unseen is something crucial to our Iman being Muslim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions very very early in his book in his kitab Al-Quran Al-Kareem Ba'ad a'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajim alif la meem thalika al-kitab la rayba fi hudan lil-muttaqeen al-ladhina yu'minuna bil-wa bil-ghayb just think about it. Allah finished Al-Fatiha. The best of all surahs. The best of all surahs. Al-Fatiha. And then he brings it to the beginning of Surah Baqarah. He mentions Alif, Lam, Mim. The letters that we cannot even give tafsir of them. That knowledge is with him alone. That we may learn in Jannah, inshaAllah. May Allah grant us gentle for those Allah, Ameen. This is the book in, when, which, in which there is no doubt There is no ambiguity There is no maybe, if so It's a hundred percent, it's clear cut For anyone who is seeking the truth This is the book that has no doubt And before anything Before anything Allah wants you know, to know that this is A guidance for who? A guidance for who? He didn't say believers He didn't say mu'mineen he didn't say Muslimin. He said who? He didn't say Anas. Hudan lil muttaqin. Who's muttaqin? Huh? Those who have taqwa. And what's taqwa? Consciousness. Oneness of Allah. Say it again. Do you, do, that, this is good. Anybody else? I'm waiting for the most famous answer we're always hearing. What's taqwa? To have the what of Allah? Fear. People say fear, right? They jump on that. It's good that you guys are jumping out with consciousness. Another brother, may Allah bless him, mentioned dutifulness. Let us not understand this word taqwa as a word. Don't understand the definition in words. Because you're going to lack. You're going to lack definition. You're going to lack ex- your explanation. In Arabic, it's hard to find... Words in English should define one word in Arabic. Yet, when we're describing a word in, in, in Arabic, you're trying to use simple words in English. For example, you say, what is taqwa? Someone will tell you the fear of Allah. You say, what's khawf? They say the fear of Allah. What's khashya? They say the fear of Allah. So now you're telling me three words in Arabic. Now you're going backwards. You're saying three Arabic words equal one English word. No, no, no. Each one of these words has its own definition, explanation. And the best possible way that I can tell you to understand taqwa is the way that Umar ibn 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 Khattab radiallahu anhu, the way he learned what taqwa is through asking of the best mufassireen, of the best 
of companions to give tafsir, to give explanation of the Qur'an, he asked Ubay ibn Ka'b. He asked him, Ya Ubay ibn Ka'b, Ma hiya at-taqwa? This is when Umar ibn Khattab was Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was Amir al-Mu'mineen at the time. He was the leader of the believers. He was the Khalifa. He was the chief of the Mu'mineen. Yet he's asking what we would consider to be a simple question to another companion who in ranks is lower than him. He asked him, what is taqwa? And this is just for us to know the status of Ubay ibn Ka'b is that Allah granted him great hikmah and great understanding of the Qur'an and the Prophet actually made dua for him to understand the Qur'an. And he asked the Amir, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, have you ever tread upon a path with many thorny plants and bushes? So Umar ibn Khattab, he said, Bala, of course. So Ubay ibn Ka'b, he said, okay, so what did you do? What did you do? He said, I took my garment, I took my clothes, and I brought it close to me, and I made sure that every step that I took, my front step and my back step was free of harm. Put his clothes close to him, his clothing, his garments close to him, and every step he took, made sure it was free from harm from these stony plants. He said, Hahiya taqwa. This is taqwa. Umar understood. He didn't have to ask. Us were sitting there dumbfounded like, uh, what are you talking about? So the ulama, they explained. They said that this path, the path that Ubay ibn Ka'b was trying to explain to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, this is the, they said, this is the dunya. The whole path from the beginning to the end until you pass this thorny path, this is the whole dunya. And all of these thorny bushes and plants and thorns, these are the muharramat. These are the things that Allah declared to be haram for us. That if it touched us, or if we allowed it to touch us, either or, whether it touches us or if we allowed allow it to touch us, we're going to fall into what? Don't say sin. Sin we know. But what's going to happen if you get poked physically? Physically you get poked, huh? You get harmed. Take a step back. Why are sins prohibited? Because they harm us. That's why something's haram. But why? Because it's going to hurt you. But gold doesn't hurt me. But drinking a little bit doesn't hurt me. But touching her definitely doesn't hurt me. Right? Kissing her definitely doesn't hurt me. Watching that definitely doesn't hurt me. It may not hurt you from what you see. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Qur'an, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Does He not know His creation best? And He is al latif the most compassionate, al khabir the most informed. Meaning, today, you say, for example, when you're a baby, and they want to give you a shot, you say, no, 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 no. You're going to hurt me, it's going to harm me. You say, no, no, it's for your own good, it's going to make you feel better. Say, no, 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 I can't, I can't. You're trying to hurt me, I don't want this, it's no good. But the reality is what? Is that it's good for you, yes or no? Yes? Okay. And how about, for example, something like alcohol? You see some of the effects, it's cool, he's having fun, he's joking, he's playing, she's chilling. Okay, it's, it's okay, it's not a big deal, they go to sleep, it's harmless, no problem. You don't see the negative effects that are going on. Whether it's your body being damaged from the alcohol, or what's happening to your mind at the time, or what you did because of being drunk, and so on and so forth. These are just two small examples to understand that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dec declared haram for us is hurtful and harmful to us. That's why He tells us not to do it. And that's why we trust in Him Azza wa Jal in terms of doing things and not doing things because we know that He knows best. Not only does He know best, He said something before knowing, before Him being Al Khabir, He says He is Al Latif. He's the most compassionate. He wants the best for us. He wants the greatest good for us. When he's telling us to do something and to stay away from something, it's from his compassion. Don't do this and do this. It's best for you. So, treading on this path, guys, this thorny path, is that we take our front step, meaning the actions that we're doing, we're going to make sure that they have no harm in it. We're not trying to do anything haram, nor are we trying to get close to anything haram. We want to stay completely away from the haram. And sometimes things that you may do that are halal in, in the early phase of things, it may lead to something this, that is doubtful, that may lead to something which is disliked Islamically, makruh, 
or completely haram. Just by you doing an action that's initially good, you have to constantly stay on that thing and make sure it doesn't take the wrong path. And this is what Ubay ibn Ka'ab tried to explain to Umar ibn Khattab is that this is taqwa. Fearing all of the evil from this dunya, taking every step, every moment in life, seeking Allah's pleasure and staying away from anything that may harm you, harmful, be harmful to you, meaning the evil things. And that is done by being dutiful. And that is done by being God conscious. Is that you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to do. Stay away from that which He asks you not to do. And when you're in that situation where you don't know what to do and you're stuck between option A and option B, you remember Him and you say, this is what's best. Islam says this is what's best. We move on, inshallah. Okay. Understanding issues of al-ghayb, understanding issues of the unseen, is that we cannot limit our knowledge, we cannot limit the explanation to our limited knowledge, if that makes sense. Meaning, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that for the person who does not wake up for fajr, who sleeps, sleeps through their prescribed prayers, for the person who memorizes the Qur'an or memorizes from the Qur'an or learns from the Qur'an and abandons it, as the hadith mentions from the dream of the Prophet ﷺ when he was taken by the angels and they saw the dream of one ginormous man standing over a small man and he's dropping a rock over his head and it's busting his head open and the rock rolls and that man picks up the rock and he does that over and over and the Prophet ﷺ said, who is this? Explain this to me and at the end he explained the dream and he said, these are for those, these are the people that either learn the Qur'an and abandon it or, and or, those who sleep out, sleep throughout the prescribed prayers. We're not talking about those who fall asleep because they're tired and end up accidentally missing a salah. We're talking about people who don't take the precaution to say, Fajr is in, Fajr is at 5 o'clock, Fajr is at 4 o'clock, Fajr is at 3 o'clock, I'm not sleeping at 1 o'clock, I'm not sleeping at 1.30, I'm not sleeping at 2 o'clock. They're taking the precautions to make sure that uh, they're not oversleeping. Their intention is not to oversleep. That's the whole point. The intention is to make every effort to pray that salah. Okay, so we cannot, we cannot understand things through our own knowledge. And also, another point of al-ghayb is that we take everything from the Qur'an and from the sunnah. Meaning, we don't all of, all of a sudden say things about the unseen that we don't know and say, this is the truth. You have to have something from the Qur'an and sunnah to back that up. It has to be authentic proof for that inshallah ta'ala and another thing is that anything that we hear from the unseen the grave hereafter Jannah Jahannam at the Hawd at the the, the, the Kawthar of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we don't translate anything metaphorically it's taken literally until there's proof to prove otherwise it's to be taken literally you have to take my words as they are, right? If I tell you something, you have to take, take them for what they are. You can't just assume that I'm being, I'm joking with you or I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I mean something else. You have to take it literally unless the time comes and I prove otherwise. Make sense? Okay. And even more so with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, with that of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Also, we should not subject our understanding of this universe and the laws within it to al-ghayb, to the unseen. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions that for the believers, the believers, their souls will be like birds. Believers. People say, Is that, isn't that for the martyrs? No, the martyrs have a different situation. The believers, their souls will be like birds flying in Jannah and eating the fruits of Jannah. So I say, time out. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a pigeon. That's whack. Right? No, see, I, I wouldn't, may Allah grant us gentle for those first of all, Allah, I mean, is that we don't, I don't, I don't want to be a pigeon. But no one said you're going to be a pigeon. And no one said you're going to be like any other bird in this dunya. It's just a bird. A bird could be in Jannah, something completely sick. Something, yani sick not meaning negative, meaning cool. Something completely cool. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the best in Jannah. May Allah grant us gentle for those, Allah, I mean. Guys say, I mean, because... This is something that you want for yourself. And by saying ameen, you're saying, Allahumma stajib. Oh Allah, please answer this dua. That's you're just adding to the dua. Don't subject the 
the laws that we know here in this dunya for the hereafter. For the mujahideen, they, they are actually their souls are in green birds that float throughout Jannah and they eat throughout Jannah and they rest from the lamps, so to speak, that hang from the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so they're constantly that close to Him Azza wa Jal, chilling, relaxing, and enjoying their time. That's just some points that we have to understand about Al Ghayb. Now, when does, this is a question I want you guys to be interactive, when does Qiyamah start? When does, I'll ask the question differently, when does our Qiyamah start? Not a, huh? Anybody else? Huh? Yes. Or in the grave. Anybody else? Anybody? When we're born. Anybody else? Depends how bad your life is, right? Anybody else? Some some others may say, for example, Qiyama starts at the hour, a sa'a, when everything is all destroyed and Allah resurrects us. This is Qiyama. Right? Qiyama means standing. Day of standing is the day you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as the brother first brother mentioned, that the true Qiyama for each individual is at the time of death. The grave is just the first stage of the barzakh, but the actual Qiyama starts at the time of death. And this is from the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated in both Bukhari and Muslim, where some of the Bedouin Arab, as Aisha radhiallahu anha, she mentions that some of the Bedouin Arab they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would constantly ask him, "Mata sa'a? When is the hour? Mata sa'a? Mata sa'a?" So one time, because they used to always ask this question. That's why the hadith mentions different narrations, because it's not different narrators, it's different times. People are coming, he's giving different answers to some of the people. What time is it? Is that he looked at this group of Arab that came, the Bedouins, and he saw the youngest of them. The youngest of them was young. And he said to them that if Allah grants him life to actually live, he will not become old until your qiyamah starts. What does that mean? That means that by the time he becomes old, you're dead. When you die, your qiyamah starts. Now, what does that mean to us? That means we have our own crews. We have our own groups. Yeah, we have our own families. And from this group, I have my son, he's three. By the time he gets old, I'm dead. The same way that when you were small, and you had people in your group that were older than you, when you grew up, you're 20, 20 something, maybe less than 20, some of you 30, Allah alam. Okay, it's funny. Huh? But besides the point, is that when you grow old, the older people in your, in, in your family, in your group, in your tribe, in your nation, your whatever, they're going to die. Their qiyamah starts. So let us understand that day to day, that we're part of a small group, whether it be a family, an organization, or whatever. And we have the young within our group. We will not see the day when they become really old. We're only going to see ourselves if Allah even grants us that life to see ourselves getting old. So don't let death, uh, don't let shaitan uh, delude you when it comes to your death. A point that we should understand about death. What is maut? What is death? When you translate things in Arabic, if you look into Arabic dictionaries, whenever there's words like death, life, uh, slow, fast, opposites, they always translate the word comparing it to its opposite. So they say, al-maut, death is the opposite of al-hayat. It's the opposite of life. And life is the movement within the, the earth, your body, animals. Trees, things growing, there's movement. There's movement going on. This is hayat. And maut is the exact opposite. When everything is in a standstill. Nothing is moving. And they say when it comes to the body, al maut means when there's no harakah, there's no movement within the body. And even deeper, the Islamic understanding of maut is when the soul is extracted from the body. This is al maut. This is death. Now, what types of death are there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that we taste death every day. Anybody know that? 
Huh? Sleeping. What happens when you sleep? Soul is taken to who? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Allahu alam. See, this is part of the unseen. I don't know. See, this is part of the unseen before we even die. The soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, He is the one who returns you to Him at night, and He knows all of that you were doing in the daytime. Forgive me guys, I'm having too many ayat in my head. He mentions, and then you, at this point, you will be resurrected to fulfill your appointed term. Forgive me, guys. He says that indeed you. Your soul is extracted. Every night your soul is extracted. And he knows what you're doing in the daytime. Alongside of this, he says, and then your soul is returned back to fulfill its appointed term. Then your soul will turn back to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you'll be questioned about what you did in this earth. So again, he's saying that as you sleep, he takes your soul. And he knows what you've been doing every single day. What does that mean? It's a threat to us. He's trying to tell you that every single time that you sleep, and you have no control over your soul, and you never have any control over your soul, but he's, the soul is out of your body. Now you have less control over, if you had any control, now you have less control. The soul is just hanging. The soul may or may not get put back. And now you should think about, what was I doing that day? Was I doing that which is pleasing to Allah or was I doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he says, but we put it back in your, in your body so you could do what? So you could just fulfill your appointed term. I took it out while you're resting and you're sleeping and you're dreaming and doing whatever you're doing. But the reality of the matter is what? I'm only putting it back so that one day I'm really going to take it out and I'm not going to put it back. Which makes us think Every time that we wake up, it should be like a restart button, right? I remember when I used to play video games, which I missed those days, days of no responsibility and no nothing, right? Just games and hitting the reset button when you lose, right? Is that whenever I didn't get a perfect score or a perfect completion or whatever, I would reset the game or reboot that level. Why? So I can just do perfect it, just do good, right? Same thing in this dunya is that we should be constantly resetting, right? I woke up, alhamdulillah. And we're going to mention what we're supposed to say when we are, uh, when we're raised from sleep. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions in the hadith, uh, from the uh, Silla hadith al sahiha from Imam al-Bani, he mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that death is the, uh, sleep is the brother of death. Sleep is the brother of death. And he mentions something about Ahl al-Jannah, which I don't wish to mention now because it's part of a long topic. And he says that people of Jannah do not sleep. Something we should think about. In Jannah, there's no sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allahu yatawaffa al-anfus hina mawtiha wallati lam tamut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that he returns the soul to him at the time of death, and he also returns which soul to him? The soul to him that it's not time to die. Meaning, when you're dead, and when you sleep, these are two times that Allah he takes a soul back to him. And then he says, فَيُمْسُكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ And the one that its soul is prescribed for to die, he just holds on to it. He doesn't put it back. And then, وَيُرْسُلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجْلِ مُسَمَّى and then he puts the soul that is supposed to fulfill its appointed time, he puts it back into the soul. He returns it. 
And then he says, وَإِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And in this, this is an ayah, this is a sign, this is a, a wake-up call for those that ponder. Those that have tafakkur, they're constantly thinking and having remembrance in Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, how many of us have been to a janazah? I'll take all the questions inshallah ta'ala at 2.40, inshallah, if that's okay. Yeah? Earlier? So, khair, I'm going to wrap this up in the next two minutes inshallah ta'ala. Three minutes. Okay. Anybody been to a janazah? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Sisters, you need to, okay. Sisters need to start doing more washings, inshallah, and going to janazahs, and it's good for you. It's healthy for you. All right. So you guys been to the janazah? Anybody seen the face? Okay. Anybody wash the body? Okay. When you're done with the washing, you finish with the washing. You ever look at the face? The eyes closed, mouth closed. How do they look? What do they say? He looks like he's sleeping. Everyone says that. That's the reality. The reality of the matter is that when you're sleeping and your soul is taken, you look the same exact way as when you're dead and the soul is taken, but one of them, the soul will be returned back. And the other, the soul is just being held up. But this soul that's returned back, it's only going to wait another day or two or year or whatever until the soul is taken back up again, but held and not put back until the grave. Until the grave. So, what should we be doing, brothers and sisters, when we understand that our soul is being taken every single night? And that one day, one of these days, or one of these nights, our soul will be taken and not put back, is that we should be giving what? Shukr. We should be giving thanks and praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every single moment above ground, with life, with breath, even if we're sick, even if we're dying, even if we lost uh, money, family, marriage, whatever it is, you have to give shukr because you're above the ground and you have more time to do what? Hasanat, good. So that Yom Qiyamah, you can find something that you're pleased with. Your book of record, you're happy with. As we'll mention inshallah ta'ala in future classes that we'll have with MGB inshallah ta'ala, many ayat which show and promote the believers when they have their book and how proud they are to show their book to others is because they prepared for this day, they knew this day was coming. Brothers and sisters, when you wake up, you have Husn al-Muslim, the fortunes of the Muslim. If you don't have, contact al he'll give you a free copy, inshaAllah. Is that, Alhamdulillah, uh, ladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. You give hamd and shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gave you life after giving you death. And to him is your final return. And then another one, Alhamdulillah, ladhi afani fi jasadi wa radda alayya ruhi wa alina li bidikri. Alhamdulillah, the one who's given me strength and ability and power in my life and he returned back to me my soul and he supported me and he helped me in his remembrance because every time we have the dhikr of Allah to say alhamdulillah, to say shukrillah, to say astaghfirullah, to pray to, to pray for, to pray the far, to pray the sunnah to be nice to our parents, to do all of this it's just a reminder from Allah that's why Da'ud he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ya Allah how can I ever be thankful to you when the remi- you're reminding me, you're the one who's reminding me to give thanks to you. So now you're, <laughs> you're in a debt. Every time you give him thanks, he's reminding you for that thanks. You can never give him full thanks. Same thing, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns your ruh back to you, give thanks for that and be appreciative of that and don't take advantage of that. Something I want to leave you guys with, this is like homework that we're going to be having in MGB inshallah ta'ala for their courses. This is, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of skipping some stuff. I want you guys to find out who is Hizqil. Hizqil. Ha, za, qaf, ya, lam. Hizqil. H I Z Q E E L. Sheikh Google, Dr. Yahoo. That's how we do. Make it quick, right? Find out who Hizqil is and then learn about his story very briefly, inshallah ta'ala. And there's an ayah that describes his people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many ayat. In, in, at the time of Musa a.s., he mentioned uh, Bani Israel when they said ya Allah, ya, Musa will never believe, believe in you until we see Allah and Allah says that he, we, we caused them to die with the thunderbolt we caused them to die and then we resurrected them so that they may give shukr for being alive now 
right? Because once you're dead, forget it, everything is over. You can no longer do good. All that time you took it for granted. But now that you're dead, like, Allah, please, please bring me back. I'll do anything good, right? Well, we're reminding you every single day. We're taking your soul every single day. We're telling you, you're going to die, right? So let us not wait until death comes to say, you know what? I think now is a good time to do it. No, now is, now is the time before you die to do good, inshallah ta'ala. Let's take questions, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And any questions? I know the sister had a question. Any question? None. I have one question. Can you explain the, the part where Allah have two souls? No, there's two different types of death. There's the death that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ بِالنَّهَارِ That he takes your soul in the night time and he knows what you did in the daytime. He's saying he actually takes your soul. يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ In Arabic, if you read in the Quran, it says, Allah, he takes your life, takes your soul. This is death. And the other one he says, Allahu يَتَوَفَّى الْإِنسَانِ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ فِي مَنَامِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes the soul at the time of death and at the time that it's sleeping. So these are the two deaths, inshallah. No, there's no, there's no, you're talking about at the extraction of the soul, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says that He's holding on to your soul, again, we don't actually say He grabbed with His hand your soul and pulled it up. Taking your soul could be taking it any way. I can run your money without taking your money. I can, you, you, you know what I'm saying? Feel me? It's a gangster, right? <laughs> you can take something without touching it. And I can, especially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has angels who handle His business, they can be the ones to take it. You understand? And in this case, of course, you mean, is there pain? Of course, we know for those that are evil, the extraction of their soul is painful. So for them, of course, it's going to be painful. Right? Naam. Are we good? Yes, sir. Will there be a what? A graveside visit. A graveside visit. Yes, inshallah, December 14th, uh, which is on a Sunday with Muhammad Shinawi. He'll be leading. Last time we had Dr. Hatim al-Hajj, inshallah, was very, very good. And the next one will be with uh, Muhammad Shinawi, December 14th. I think like tomorrow, I guess we'll start pushing out, uh, you know, I guess marketing, so to speak, if that's the proper terminology, we'll be mentioning it to the brothers and sisters that we're going to have another graveside reminder, December 14th. Good? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik shadun la ilaha ant wa astaghfiruk tu bilayk. Again, guys, this was something more academic because we're going to be having some courses in MGB. Uh, but it's beneficial because this leads to a lot of things about death, inshallah ta'ala. بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم الله بركاته